campus in St. Paul, Minnesota. So we're gonna look at the benefits of these grants, the tax consequences, how you can assist providers in applying for them, and how to answer questions about these grants. I am an attorney. I have uh, been working on the business side of family childcare for decades, trying to help people be more successful. If you have questions after what I'm talking about today, feel free to give me a call. Here's my phone number or send me an email. I don't charge anything for answering questions. Uh, I think you'll have the ability to get a copy of these slides afterwards. Uh, I've sent them on and so they, uh, they should be available so that you don't have to take uh, precise notes as we're going along today. Your questions about general business childcare stuff could well be answered on my website, tomcopelandblog.com where I posted hundreds of articles on all aspects of the business side of family childcare. And if you want, you can direct providers to my website for that purpose. I'm also on Facebook. Every time I post an article on my website, it will appear on my Facebook page and people can ask questions on Facebook. Now, as we're going along, if you have questions, you can post a question in chat. So just, as I'm going along, I'm going to look at chat and as questions come up, I'll try to answer them that way. And then I'll be pausing it several times. And at, at the times I'm pausing, then I'll say, if you want to talk to me, you can unmute yourself and speak. And depending on how this goes, we may have more time at the end for additional questions, but feel free to post your questions throughout. Now, I'm not providing you with professional tax advice as an individual. All right, so I'm gonna be uh, doing a session tonight. I'll be doing a session on Saturday. I'll be uh, doing other trainings around these stabilization grants. So um, I wanna make sure uh, that we all understand and we're all on the same page about this stuff. It's good news. I hope everybody realizes we gotta start with this is fantastic. Uh, this is terrific. There's a lot of money coming into childcare. This will really, really benefit family childcare providers and childcare centers. So the purpose of these grants is to provide financial relief to cover business costs associated with COVID. That's what the rules say. And to help stabilize people's operations. In other words, keeping people in business so they can care for kids. And it's a loan. It's, <laughs> well, it's not a loan. It's not a loan. It's a grant. People don't have to pay it back. So that sometimes confusion comes, oh, money, somebody's giving me money, I'm gonna have to pay it back. I don't want it. No, people don't have to pay it back. So we wanna encourage everybody to apply. I'll talk later about perhaps some circumstances where people may not want to get the grant. But for 99% of the people, they want the money. They should get the money. <clears throat> you should encourage everybody to apply without hesitation. And the deadline is November 30th. It's a firm deadline. So we're a little ways away from that, but still, we don't want people to wait for the last minute. There's no reason not to apply now. Uh, here's the main link, as you probably all know, to the New York, uh, uh, website where they go into this in great detail. To be eligible, providers must be licensed or registered or legally exempt as of March 11th earlier this year. And even if you don't have kids, providers are still eligible as long as they meet this standard. How much are providers going to get? Holy cow, a family child care provider can expect to get an average of about $19,000 or a higher amount if they're in Westchester or Long Island. A group provider can get an average of $38,000. Holy cow. 
It's going to be paid out in six monthly payments. And payments will begin about 30 days of when they apply. So people should apply sooner rather than later, because then they can start getting the money. Now, six months it means it's going to carry over until 2022. Providers will report as income the money they actually got in 2021. And then the amount they actually get in 2022, they'll report on their 2022 taxes. What can this money be used for? Paying yourself or employees. Rent, mortgage payments, utilities, insurance. This is right off the New York website. Facility maintenance and improvements, COVID supplies, general operating expenses, other goods and services, mental health, professional development. Well, um, question, enrolled exempt providers only for New York, not all. New York City, you mean? Pam, is that what you're no. saying? No, uh, we, uh, New York State only is, the stabilization grant is only covering the legally, the enrolled legally exempt group, not enrolled legally exempt. exempt. <laughs> so it there gets a little different. confusing. It, it yeah. gets a little confusing here. So clarify, because this is what it okay. says on the website. Legally, legally exempt group, are programs such as uh, programs housed in a church or a uh, school age program, um, things that are not uh, uh, regulated, but it's not the person who takes care of two children, you know, from next door or they take, they're taking care of their relatives in their home. Okay, that it, helps. So it is, it is confusing to say the least. So legal exempt meaning as I say here, enrolled with an enrollment agency. And that's right. what you're talking about, school age, church programs, et cetera. But right. that's a really good point. So the, the typical definition, the, the common definition of legal exempt is you're right, caring for one child and not required to be licensed, they are not eligible. Right. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so um, here's where I want to, focus on first. This personnel costs, let's go back here. Uh, well, it's the language used in a grant can, is, can be confusing. So personnel costs, paying yourself, what the heck does that mean? It essentially means providers can take the money from this grant and say that it's for themselves without having to spend it on anything else. And once they pay themselves, this money is mine, then it's theirs. They can use it for whatever they want. In other words, they can put it in their retirement account. They can take a vacation to Hawaii. They can create an emergency fund. They can make major home improvements, none of which are allowed directly for use of the money by the grant, but indirectly after paying yourself. All right. So. Let's talk about this. I want to jump. Do I want to jump forward? Yeah, I want to jump forward because it seems like. Um, all right. How do you show that you're paid yourself? I should have put this in early. One, if a provider has more than one bank account, they can simply transfer the money from the bank account where they got the money into another bank account from their business account to their personal account, from their personal account to their business account, and say, that was paying myself. Now, how do they say that? If they're, uh, they could just write a note somewhere, a record to say, on this date, on uh, October 13th, I transferred $5,000 from this account to this account. This was payment for myself under the stabilization grant. Number two they could write a check to themselves. And in the memo line put stabilization grant paying myself. Or they don't have two bank accounts. They could simply leave the money in the same bank account. There's nowhere else for them to transfer it to. And write a note to themselves and say, on October 13th, I received $18,000 from the stabilization grant. And this money I'm using to pay myself because 
with a provider mostly who only have one bank account, all the money's coming in to that bank account, the grant, the parent payments, the food program checks and so on. And then they're writing checks out to pay business stuff and personal stuff out of this one bank account, which is fine, assuming they're self-employed. So just to say this amount from the grant is for myself is essentially, that's it. Because all the money that a provider has after paying out business expenses is money for herself. So maybe there's another way to say it. Let's say before the grant, 2000. 20, a provider took in $50,000 and she spent $20,000 on her business. She had 30,000 left over profit from her business. She can just, that's 30,000 is hers. That in, in, in essence is paying herself. That's her money. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is a biggie because people get confused. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm self-employed. I don't have an employee. How can I possibly pay myself? So therefore, I can't use this money for myself because I'm not paying myself. See, so we need to say to people, no, 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 uh, you can do that. You just take it all in and describe it as paying yourself or transfer money. All right, so let me go back. All right. Rent, mortgage, utilities. Now, the New York doesn't say, and the federal guidelines don't say, but I'm assuming, I think it's reasonable to say that providers could use their business portion of these expenses for the grant. Um, and the business portion is gonna be their time and space percentage, all right? Liability insurance, however, they're able to deduct 100%. So it's just the normal, the rules of tax deductions, the business portion, they can say is used by the grant. Whoop, sorry. Facility maintenance and improvements. So minor res, uh, renovations, the money can be used for, but not for major renovations. And the only guidance here that says, well, playground equipment, bathroom renovation, replacing carpeting and repairs are described in the guidance. That's minor and you can use the money for that. But major would be a construction like build, adding an addition, uh, building a shed, building a garage, major renovations or remodeling. Major renovations, they talk about removing load bearing walls, extensive alterations. Well, okay, that's, that's as much guidance as we got. Now, what about buying a fence, putting in a, a patio, basement remodeling, kitchen countertops, new windows, new doors? Are those minor or are those major? So I wanna say a couple things about this. If I use my common sense on this, I would say a fence is not a major renovation of a home. And I would say the same thing for a patio. Now it's confusing because they say a bathroom renovation counts. What about a basement remodeling, which is more common that might come up? Well, that's a tough one. I mean, basement, it could be just some, you know, minor, you know, put down some carpeting and that's it or putting up some sheetrock. Now, is that a major renovation? Boy, that's a close call. I don't know. Kitchen countertops sound to me like a minor reno renovation. New windows, all new windows? Yeah, that's, to me, I don't, I'm not sure. New doors, I think that's minor. I think that's minor. Um, and the question about how to figure out taxes uh, and setting aside money, I'm gonna get to that. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that. So here's the problem with this. Um, and I got a slide on this. So I should have put this in the right order. Here we go. What if I'm not sure about what I can spend the money on? You get a question from a provider, uh, can I use the money for this? And you go, well, I don't know. 
And the, the problem here is we don't want to say some, oh yeah, you can do it for this. And then somehow people get audited later and they say, no, you can't. And now, oh man, providers are angry, providers are upset. Providers don't have to submit receipts or records to show, to tell the state, DHS, how they spent the money. They don't have to. It's only in the case of an audit where this would be tricky. Well, okay, so what's the answer? I think the answer is this. If you're not sure, if you are not sure if this particular expense meets the definition of what's eligible for the grant, or the provider says, I'm not sure, and you can't clearly answer it, then I think the best thing to say is, look, let's not take a chance. Just say you spent that money, not on the basement remodeling that we're not quite sure about, but just say you spent that money on yourself. You were gonna spend $5,000 remodeling the basement. Okay, pay yourself $5,000. Then once you do that, you can use the 5,000 to remodel the basement. And I think that's the safe way out of this dilemma. And we got a question about the tax consequences of paying yourself. I'm gonna to get to that in a minute. So let's go back here. Goods and services, food, food for the business, equipment, materials for play, software to run their business, shared services, expenses, cleaning, paying somebody to come in and clean their house, transportation. So it says transportation, but well, does that mean you can buy a new vehicle with it? Boy, I don't know. I don't know. That it seems like you should be able to, but that's a big expense. And without guidance from the state about this, I'm not so sure. I don't want to um, I don't want to give bad advice. So I would say I don't know on that question. Question, when speaking about minor, whoops, there we go. When speaking about minor repairs, I believe the guidance states that these would address COVID concerns. How would you justify that? Well, yeah, COVID concerns, meaning the way I would interpret that is being able to stay in business during a time of COVID, being able to provide the kind of care you wanna provide care for uh, that would be, you bid, be better able to provide it during an environment of COVID. Now, I don't think the, I know what you're saying. I don't think it means you can only spend it on minor repairs. What, Bro a broken glass? That's a minor repair. You gotta replace the glass. You gotta comply with the licensing rules to keep the house safe. So to me, that's all part of staying in business during the age of COVID. Uh, the, the federal guidance, I know the, the New York, it sort of just repeats it, but I wouldn't limit it to, you know, gloves and masks and, you know, providing handicapped accessibility to somebody who's tested co positive for COVID. No, that's what I would say. Um, question, does a provider need to justify paying large sums to themselves, such as lost income, versus prior year due to COVID? Or can they just do it and write a note to keep it in their file for it? I haven't seen anything in the New York guidance that says you can't just pay yourself irregardless of what your circumstances were last year. In other words, last year I lost $10,000, let's say, uh, because of parents leaving. And so therefore I can only use $10,000 of it for this year, of the grant for this year. I don't read it that way. It doesn't, it doesn't limit it that way. It doesn't say that. So therefore, I think you can use it all to pay yourself. Now, even a provider, let's say, who's at full enrollment today and has been in full enrollment for the entire year so far and expects to be in full enrollment for the rest of the year. They haven't lost a dime. They're making more money than they did last year. Does that mean they can't use the money to pay themselves? Not that I see. Not that I see because maybe they've kept their rates low. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, I don't see anything that says they have to justify paying themselves. Now, I should have said this when I started. 
I'm giving you my opinion after looking carefully at what's on the New York website and reading carefully the federal regulations about this. If I'm saying something that you think is wrong or later down the road, you get, you hear something from somebody else that says, Tom, I think what you said was wrong. I wanna hear about it. I wanna hear about it. I wish states, New York, all the other states, I wish they would do more to clarify things and say, can this money be used for a van? Can this money be used even if you're at full enrollment and haven't lost a dime? I wish they would clarify these things, but until they do, I would say on the van, I don't know. On paying yourself, I would say, yeah, you can, because it doesn't, there's nothing there that says you can't. Question. Food, how does that work if the provider is on the food program and getting reimbursed? Well, good question. Um, there's nothing in the guidance about this other than you can use it for food. Uh, parents are paying for uh, money that's used to pay for utilities. And now we get a grant. Uh, can we also use a grant for utilities? Yes. So is that double dipping? I don't think so. I haven't, federal guidance doesn't say anything about this. Here's, let me say one other thing. In the rare, rare instance of somebody getting audited, and I don't know how much that's gonna happen, I think it's gonna be rare. Remember, providers do not submit receipts, do not tell the state how they spent the money. They're just gonna say, I spent it. So rare, rare case, somebody gets audited and they say, I spent $2,000 on food. And the auditors come in and say, well, you got reimbursed for that 2000 from the food program. So you can't use the grant money for food. Well, the provider, it seems to me could say, well, okay, I hear you, but actually I use that 2000 to pay myself. To me, that's the out. That's why, in my opinion, providers should say they spent all of the money on themselves. So we don't have to worry about um, failing to meet some other expense category, failing to account for the time space percent, you know, getting a headache about record keeping about all these other things that it could be used for. Just take all the money for yourself. Lastly, mental, well, not lastly, mental health supports. Uh, you know, it's, there's a broad category that people could use money for themselves, mental support for themselves. And again, if we're not sure, just spend it on yourself. And this is, and again, the main uh, page for information from New York. Uh, record keeping, yeah. We just, Got a question coming up on that. You need to keep the records in case you're audited for five years, five years after the year that you got the money. And normally people are keeping their business records for three years for IRS purposes. But for this grant money, it's five years. Again, uh, simply I spent it all for myself. That's the record. Here's the note I made. Here's the record of the transfer of the money from one bank account to another, that's it. Uh, okay, all right. So now let's get to specifics around tax consequences here. It's income. This money is income. They gotta report it, taxable income. They're gonna get a form 1099 at the end of the year from the state. That form will say, you got whatever, $18,000 from the stabilization grant. And the IRS will get that same 1099. So the IRS will know that that provider got $18,000. Therefore, providers need to make sure they're putting it on their tax return. If they're not putting it on their tax return, and this is a lot of money, uh, that will greatly increase the chances that they will get audited. Grants are treated as income, this grant, just the same way as parent tuition, subsidy program payments, the food program reimbursements, 
those things are also income. So this is treated in the same way. And we want to say again, so what? Uh, they got money and they have to pay some taxes on them. Are, uh, that's okay. And why is it okay? Because even though people in some cases are gonna to have to pay some a little bit more in taxes, they'll always have more money left over after paying the taxes. You get money from the food program, report it as income, pay taxes on it, they still have money left over. People are not gonna be taxed at 100%. They're always, no matter what, as we go through these examples, they will always be better off financially after receiving this grant. Uh, okay. Uh, if a provider spends it all on their own to themselves, would they first pay themselves and then pay taxes, Social Security, and then put it in retirement? First of all, when a provider pays herself, that's not uh, the same as paying an employee. If you're paying an employee, uh, you can deduct it. You can deduct the wages. When you pay yourself, you can't deduct it, as we're going to see in a minute. Right? So they pay themselves. They report, well, let's see, better to show you with the examples. And so I'm going to get back to that question. What taxes might people owe on this grant? They're going to owe about 15% Social Security Medicare tax, 10 to 21% federal income tax, depending on their tax bracket and their personal circumstances, 4 to 8.8% .8 New York state income tax, depending on their family's situation. So we're talking about roughly 30 to 40% in taxes. Now, again, that's okay. That's okay. If you paid 30 or 40% in taxes, you still have 70, 60 to 70% of the money left over. Do you want more income? Yes. If you got $10,000 and you're paying 30% tax, you're paying an additional $3,000 in taxes. Oh, no, oh, no. You're going to have 7,000 left over. If you got a $10,000 grant and paid 40% in taxes, you're going to pay $4,000 in tax. Oh, no. You're going to have 6,000 left over. Do you still want the 10,000 knowing this? Yes. Yes. Question about the higher tax bracket. It's possible that the additional grant income will push a provider into a higher tax bracket. That's possible. But this is still not a reason to reject the grant. Why? Let's say a provider's in the 12% federal income tax bracket. And, and let's say she's $1 under that. And let's say she gets $15,000. So virtually $15,000 is now pushing her into the 21% tax bracket, which is the next tax bracket. Holy cow. Well, only the 15,000 that is in the higher tax bracket is charged at the 21% tax rate. All her other income will be taxed the same way as before. So people misunderstand, oh, I, you kicked me into a 21% tax bracket. That means I'm gonna have to pay 21% tax on all my other money. No, this higher tax bracket only impacts the grant money, not all the other money. So that's still okay. Yeah, you're gonna to have to pay a little more tax on your grant, but nothing else is gonna change. Uh, isn't it kind of silly that this federal government money going to providers, which will then be partially paid back to the government in tax? Yeah, yeah, that's the way it works. <laughs> that's the way it works. You're right, but uh, don't ask me to fix the government. That's correct. Uh, question, is it correct that for nonprofit daycare centers or school age programs would not receive a 1099 and do not claim it as income? I don't know. Seems to me they still would get a 1099. Now the not-for-profit would not pay tax. Let's see. I'm pausing here. I, I, I don't want to guess in this area. I, I 
I'm guessing, well, I'm, I'm guessing when I said I wasn't gonna guess. I don't know. Are nonprofits gonna get a 1099 or school age programs gonna get a 1099? I don't know the answer to that. All right, let me catch up a question here. Tax bracket, we got that. Question, food program money is not income. They pay tax on food when purchased. No, no, no. Money from the food program is taxable income. They can deduct, a provider can deduct food costs either using the standard meal allowance method or they can save receipts and estimate their actual cost of food. So if a provider got 5,000 from the food program reimbursements, she's got to report it as income. One exception is if she got reimbursements for her own children, that money is not income. But any food that a provider's own children eat is not deductible. So 5,000 of income, you got to report it as income. Then you claim food expenses. And the vast majority of providers are claiming food expenses that exceed the amount they got from the food program. But you don't wanna tell providers it's a wash. You got money from the food program, you spent money on food, you don't report anything. No, no. I've written about this in more detail. If you wanna send me an email, I can give you some information about why, where the IRS says this and give you more about that if you want. All right. Um, Ah, here we go. Great, we got an answer. New York is not sending 1099s to not-for-profits and not uh, and did not send them for the CARES grant. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. Uh, nonprofits, somebody else say, don't get 1099. Okay, great. Uh, how is it that the grant is only taxed at the higher bracket if pushed over into the next bracket? Well, let's let, let me try to explain it this way. Uh, we're talking, let's talk about the federal tax brackets. So the first bracket is 10%. That means money up to, and I don't know the amount. It depends on whether you're single, married, filing jointly, and so on. But money, and I just, I'll make up numbers. Let's say the, the, break, up, uh, the break point for 10% for a single person is 40,000. I don't know. The first 40,000 is taxed at 10%. The next bracket is 12%. And let's say that's uh, 50,000. So the money between 40 and 50,000 is taxed at 12. Again, the money below that is taxed at 10. The money from 10 to 12 is taxed at 12. And the amount from 12 to 21, whatever that is, 90,000, is taxed at 21. So people's income is taxed at varying amounts as their income goes up. And the more their income, the more tax they're gonna pay at that higher bracket, but they're still only paying 10% at their first 40,000 or whatever that is. All right, I hope that, that makes sense. So this, you know, I hear this about the food program, oh, it's gonna kick me to a higher tax bracket. And so because of the great amount of money here with these grants, this is likely to come up even more. So um, you just gotta reassure people, it will only, affect your grant money. No other income will be taxed at a higher rate because you get this grant. All right. Now, there could be some rare exceptions where providers could reasonably worry about not wanting to get the grant because it may or may not disqualify them from receiving Section 8 housing vouchers, Medicaid, health insurance credits, or college scholarships. And I don't wanna give definitive answers about this. If the union or CCRNR wants to uh, communicate about this, I say, go ahead. Um, but I hesitate to answer this question uh, without being able to give an official answer. So, until providers get an official answer, they may want to check, they would have to check on their own and find out, hey, how much more money would I have to earn before I become ineligible for these other programs? And is it possible if they find that out, 
oh, I could still get another five thousand um, uh, dollars of the grant and still be under my eligibility. And if so, hey, I only want five thousand of the grant. Or, gee, the grant is uh, thirty-eight thousand dollars, and these vouchers of Medicaid or something else is not worth that much. And so I'm better off getting the grant, even if I become ineligible for some other programs. So providers would have to do a comparison there until we get a clear answer for how the grants affect these situations. All right, so now let's be a little more specific. I wanna give three examples here. This is the heart of what I wanna say. Let's say a provider gets $15,000. And let's say they use all of that to pay themselves, which is what I'm recommending. They're gonna pay approximately $4,500 or $6,000 in taxes. The 30 to 40% is rough. It's not precise, okay? But it's, it's a good ballpark number to use. You're gonna pay about 30 or 40%, somewhere in the middle. Sometimes it might be a little bit lower, but I think these are good examples to use. So. At the 30% level, they paid 4,500 in taxes. They still have 10,500 left over in their pocket. At the higher level, they're paying 6,000 in taxes. They have 9,000 left over. Okay, we don't want people to get bent out of shape about the extra taxes. Holy Toledo, my husband says we're gonna pay $6,000 more in taxes. That's terrible. No, no, you're gonna have 9,000 left over. Another way of saying this is, do you wanna win the New York State lottery of $15,000? You just won the lottery, $15,000, do you want it? Well, yeah, are your taxes gonna go up? Yes, do you care? No, because you're still having more money after you won the lottery. Somebody had a question about social security, we're gonna to get to that. All right, situation number two. They got the $15,000 grant. They spend it on items used by their business and by their family, which could be very common, shared toys, a computer, a TV, a swing set, uh, house cleaner, and so on. Well, they can only use the money on the business portion of these shared expenses. And the business portion, I'm just gonna say, is the time space percent, of 35%. Uh, just an example, 35% is in the ballpark of what a provider's time space could be, could be less, could be more. So $15,000 minus $5,200 of expenses. In other words, all of this money was shared. We can only use 35% of it towards a grant. That leaves $9,700 of taxable income. At the 30% level, that's $2,900 in taxes. They got 6,800 bucks left. If they're paying the higher tax rate, they're paying $3,900 in taxes and have $5,800 left over. So they have less, remember previous slide, 10,000, 9,000. Now, because they're using it some for their business, it's 6,000, 5,000. Still, still better off than a kick in the head. Tax consequence number three, they spend it on items used exclusively for their business. Food, paying yourself, food, toys. Uh, whoops, whoops, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm realizing, delete pay yourself. Let's not talk about paying yourself here in this example. Sorry, I put that in there. Food, toys, they had wages for employees, COVID supplies, children's furniture, stuff, used only in their business. 15,000 of income, they're normally able to deduct the 15,000. So they don't have any taxable income, no taxes. They don't have anything left over in their pocket. Which is better off financially? Paying themselves or buying stuff with the grant? Financially, they're better off paying themselves. They're paying more taxes because they're paying taxes on all of it rather than some of it or rather than none of it. But after the taxes, they have money left over, more money 
left over. Now, somebody asked a question earlier, tax planning. All right, they're deciding to spend some or all of it on themselves, which means they're gonna owe some taxes. And so the advice would be, roughly speaking, rough, I thought about this for a while, and I wanna be a little bit conservative. So roughly, people should set aside about 30% of this for federal and state income taxes, social security taxes. If people are fine, filing estimated taxes, and the next one won't be until January 15th for the last four months of this year, they might, may want to set aside and pay more in estimated quarterly taxes if they are filing quarterly. If they're not filing quarterly and their spouse is withholding enough money from his or her paycheck, the provider may say to the spouse, look, you should withhold more now. Here's 30% of what I'm getting. Uh, withhold more over the course of the six months so that uh, we can cover ourselves and don't end up with a big surprise at the end of the year. The tax rate, you know, is going to vary. Their providers are always going to owe the 15% Social Security tax on the money they pay themselves. Uh, but their federal tax bracket, their personal circumstances, how many dependents do they have? How many other child care credits do they have? How many other personal circumstances do they have? That can vary. So I think I'm being conservative and saying, set aside about 30% for taxes. All right, providers who wanna spend the money to improve the quality of their program should go ahead and do it. This can be an opportunity for many providers to say, you know what, I've been, you know, I, I've been waiting to replace these worn out toys, to fix my rug, to uh, take this class, and I want to spend it because I need to. I've been thinking about it. It's an important thing to improve my program. Uh, this is going to help. All right, fine, great, spend it. But, and here's a big issue that I hope providers don't fall into this trap. Don't spend the money just because you have it. There's a tendency, I think, for everybody over the course of our life, as our income goes up, you know, we're graduating from college, we're working, working over time, over time. In general, for most people, over the years, your income goes up. But at the same time, our expenses go up. So, now we have the opportunity to get a whole lot more money. Holy cow, now is the time I wanna buy that new coat. I wanna, you know, let's go to the theater four times a week. Let's, let's, let's have a ball, let's spend the money. Look at all this money we got. Well, well, see, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like it for several reasons. One, I think those people are less likely to sit, set aside the 30% of, money for their taxes. So they get to the end of the year and they face a big tax bill. And it's like, whoops, wow, I'm, I'm really hurting. And we don't want that to happen. Secondly, most people, how can I, how can I say this carefully? Um, most people aren't doing enough planning, financial planning for their future. Most people don't have an emergency fund. Most people haven't paid off their credit cards in full. Most people still have car loan debt, student loan, not car, yeah, car loan interest, student loans, um, uh, you know, have hardly anything in their checking accounts or savings account and are not saving for retirement. So um, this can be an opportunity to work on those financial planning issues and get themselves in a better financial state overall. And that to me is a good use of money. In general, the concept is you're better off financially holding on to the money than spending. It. Even if you're spending it on something you can deduct in your business. If you need it, if it's important to the quality of your program, if, if it's important, 
okay, fine. But do not look around for ways to buy money. Do not say now it's time to open up the uh, uh, catalog for toys and just start shopping away. No. All right. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I want to say something about Social Security, and I thought I had a slide on it. So give me a second. Why did I not have a slide on it? Uh, did I miss it? Well, okay. So I, I thought I had a slide on it. Sorry. So here's the thing about Social Security. Question. Would providers re receiving Social Security retirement face penalties? Ah. Providers can start receiving Social Security at age 62. Their full retirement age is age 66 or 67, depending on when they're born. Let's use 67. A provider is between age 62 and 67, and she starts claiming Social Security and continues to work. For 2021, the amount that she can earn and not have it affect their Social Security benefits is about close to $19,000 profit. So getting this huge chunk of money from um, this grant, and remember it's paid out monthly, so maybe there's gonna be three or four months or so uh, this year that they would get the money, but that could kick them over the amount that they can earn while claiming social security before their full retirement age. Now, what that means is that their social security benefit will go down a little bit. Now, social security is complicated. And this is something, I don't know if you wanna get into this, but, but let's say that happens. I don't know how much the benefit will go down by, but it'll go down by something. Now, on the other hand, they got a lot of extra money. So they're still better off financially. What will happen after their full retirement age, they will start getting back this lost benefit. So over the long run, they're still gonna get what they're entitled to, even if they got less now. Oh, cow, it gets complicated. Uh, but, but the message still is, okay, you're on social security, you're before your full retirement age, you still want the grant because $18,000, $38,000, no way in the world will your social security benefit go down by that much. So you will always be better off even in that situation. Now, after somebody reaches their full retirement age of 66 or 67, it doesn't matter how much they earn, their social security benefit will not go down. All right, uh, question. What if you elect to, to reimburse expenses from January, 2020, or when COVID started, how does that get claimed? Um, um, I, for, uh, I forget, is it, is it uh, I should have remembered this. Under the grant, you can use it for expenses going back. Are you saying back to January of 2020? I don't remember what that back date is, but let's just say it is. No, you can't deduct expenses from 2020 on your 2021 tax return. So you can say that you use the money for that, but it has the same effect as paying yourself because you don't get a deduction this year for previous year's expenses. If for some reason a provider realized they were entitled to claim some expenses for 2020 that they didn't, the only way to get that back is to file an amended tax return. And then they get a refund on their 2020 tax return. All right, so somebody's saying it's January 31st, 2020 that expenses can be used for going back. So that gives us a little more leeway to say, well, I'm using, you know, I was hurting financially in 2020. It's easier for me to say now that I'm using some of this money because I was hurting financially in 2020. But again, 
it doesn't really matter how much people made in 2020 or 2021. All right. Uh, question, if they take the grant and they get a 1099, would this not help increase their, ah, would this not help increase their social security benefit amount in full retirement due to having earned that higher income? Ah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes. So a provider's benefit from social security, just like everybody listening, your benefit from social security is based on the highest 35 years of earnings over your lifetime. And if this grant boosts up a provider's income for both 2021 and 2022, when they get the rest of it, and they're using most of it to pay themselves, and, and so they're not increasing deductions, so that means their profit is higher, that will go into the calculation of the 35 years. And if that, for these two years, if that is higher than the average over the last 35 years, then yes, it will have the effect of slightly increasing the amount that they're gonna receive from social security. That is another good argument that I don't make and I should. Another good argument, you want the grant. This will help increase your social security benefits. That's a, I think that's a really good argument to make. Great. I'm glad to hear that. All right. I think I'm going back and looking. I think I picked up the questions that people have. Let's just see here. Da, 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 da. Taxes, yes. Uh, receipts, yes. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's summarize here your primary job. You need to make sure you understand how this benefits all providers and all providers should apply for this money. Okay, there's slight rare exceptions over here for section eight vouchers and Medicaid. Okay, all right. But for everybody else, look, there's no reason for you not to get the money. You want the money, apply now, don't wait. The sooner you apply, the sooner you're gonna get the money. Secondly, you're always financially better off. You want the money. Don't listen to anybody tell you uh, that you're gonna get hurt financially. Are your taxes gonna go up? Probably yes, probably less. Maybe this helps. If your spouse came home and said, I got a raise, should we accept it? Do we want our spouse to earn more money? Well, yeah. They're gonna pay a little more in taxes, but we want the money. If the parents in your program said, we don't think you're being paid enough, we all agreed to pay you $100 more per week. Do you want it? Well, you're gonna to have to pay taxes on that extra 100 bucks per family, but you want it. You want it anyway. You want the lottery, you wanna win the lottery. You wanna be, be on the food program. If somebody's offering you money, you take it and forget about the tax consequences. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, if you set aside money to pay taxes on the grant, if you use the grant money, is it 100% or time space percent? If you're using the grant money on something that's used exclusively for the business, never used personally, then you can do use the grant for the 100%. So if the swing set costs $1,000 and a provider's children are in college, you can use a full $1,000 with the grant money. If the swing set is used by the provider's own children, they can't use $1,000 of the grant money for the swing set. They can only use the business portion of the thousand, which I'm saying is the time space percent, whatever that is, if it's 30%, then they can only use $300 of the grant money for that swing set. Some providers have asked about pools. Yeah, okay, Here's a, that's a good question. Is that a major renovation or is that a minor improvement? I think it's major, you know? Does that not affect the property value of the home, putting in a pool? 
I think it does. Uh, to me, that's major. That's my opinion. Now, if, again, if you're not comfortable answering that question, and I could see why you would not be comfortable because this is a big one. What's the difference between major and minor? And boy, we don't want to make a mistake. And, and we don't want to say, yeah, yeah, I think so. And then everybody's going to hear about it from everybody else. Oh, pools. Oh, this, oh, that. Yeah, everybody said it was okay. <sighs> That's a tough one. So I guess I would say to that person, you know what? I think you should just pay yourself and then use that money for the pool. And that's clearly, clearly a lot. Uh, question, if they pay themselves, do they get taxed on it differently than if they use it on business expenses covered on the, under the eight categories? Well, I hope I tried to explain that, but apparently I didn't do a very good job. So, um, if they use all the money to pay themselves, they're gonna pay tax on all the money. If they use all the money for something exclusively for their business, they're not gonna pay any taxes on it because they able to deduct it all and say they spent it all on the grant uh, categories, no taxes. If they use it for stuff that's business and personal, they're gonna be able to deduct some of it and therefore won't have to pay tax on that. But the other part of it, the personal part of it, they will have to pay taxes. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And okay. All right. That was an earlier question I got back to. Uh, okay. Let me catch up here. 99 Social Security. Um, all right, you're one of the ones that's collecting social security and full retirement age, but still working the higher pay increase raise for social security. Yes, yes. The more income you show, that goes into the calculation of the highest 35 years of earnings, and that will increase your social security amount. If people wanna know more specifically of how this increase in the grant money, because remember, it's a lot, would affect their social security benefit, they can find that out by going to the social security website, uh, www.ssa, social security administration.gov. And there's a, you look for the social security estimator. It's called an estimator and they can plug in. So you can say, all right, let's say, I'm gonna retire at age 70. That's the latest age you can collect social security. I'm gonna collect social security at age 70. I'm now 55, whatever. What if I uh, show a $15,000 higher income? Well, let's break it into pieces. A $10,000 higher income for 2021 and a $5,000 higher income than normally I would have for 2022, you can plug in your estimated income between your current age and the age you wanna collect social security. And then it'll recalculate and tell you how much that will impact your social security benefit. When you go onto the social security website and look at your annual statement, you have to set up your own account and so on, password and so on. And so now you get in there and it'll show you each year for 2021, your annual social security statement says at age 62, if you take, take social security at age 62, this is how much you get. If you start claiming it at your full retirement age, this is how much you can get each month or at age 70, how much you can get. So you can see just based on those numbers, how much more you would get the longer you wait. But then using this estimator, you can say, well, with this additional 15,000 of income over two years or 20,000 or 30,000, how much will that change my social security benefit? You'll see that it goes up. I can't tell you how much it will go up, but it will go up. And I think that's, uh, if, so, if somebody is hesitating and you can't think of anything else to tell them, say, look, go to the social security website and see how much more you're gonna get from social security just by taking this money. Forget about the after-tax benefit that you're gonna have, it'll also increase your social security benefit. 
All right. Uh, okay, okay. How do providers calculate the appropriate amount to pay themselves? There is no appropriate amount. It can all be used to pay themselves. So I know this is a, this is a, I wish the states, the federal government had just clarified this because it's clear that if a provider had an employee and providers, some providers do have employees, providers can use the grant money to pay their employees. Providers can use the grant money to raise the salary of their employees, to give them a bonus, to give them benefits. I'm gonna start contributing to your retirement. I'm gonna give you paid vacations. I'm gonna give you pay for some of your medical expenses. I'm gonna pay for whatever a normal employer could pay as a benefit to their employee. And all of that is an appropriate use of the grant money. So it also says the provider is treated like an employee because the, the language says, you know, employee, self-employed people, that's a provider. So that's why I say you're, you're not limited to what you can do to pay yourself, whether you call it paying yourself a higher wage, if you will, or a bonus or giving yourself a two week paid vacation or whatever else benefits, it's all under the category of you're paying yourself. And I know that's gonna be, continue to be a struggle for many providers. And I wish the state had made it easier. Let me say one other thing about this. Um, some providers are familiar with the word draw. Some providers will take out of their business account 100 bucks a week, 500 bucks a month, something, and transfer it to their personal account and call it a draw, which in um, uh, accounting terms is a way of tracking how much the provider is making. And it's so. For some people who think and use those words, and I would not use the word draw unless a provider is already bringing it up. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they're calling it. It doesn't matter whether the provider writes down draw, 100 bucks a week, draw, 100 bucks a week, draw, because all of the money that comes into a provider's account is hers. It's not, she's not an employee. She, she's the boss. And the boss keeps all the money. And the boss can take the money out of that account for whatever they want. I'm going to take out $5,000 right away because I want to buy uh, clothing and, and, and personal furniture. Fine. It, there's no rule that says you can't take the money out for whatever purpose you want. So if you call it a draw or some of it a draw, okay. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you call it. So what's uh, an appropriate amount, it's whatever a provider thinks. And again, I think the safest thing is just take it all for yourself. Now, providers might be resistant to that. Okay, that sounds too good to be believed, Tom. I just am uncomfortable. You know, it's just too much money that giving myself, and I'm just not used to that. And I, I don't like, it. okay, I would say okay, then designate some of this money for some of these other categories of expenses. And then whatever's left over, whatever you feel like is appropriate after you spent the money on these other things, then call it paying yourself. In the end, if there, let's, let's, let me say a little bit different. So, a provider's normally, see if you can follow me on what I'm saying here. If a provider is normally spending, let's say, $2,000 on some of these allowable expenses, they're paying for these things anyway, utilities, mortgage payments, whatever. To, let's just say $2,000, all right? So they spent $2,000 last year on this stuff. They're going to spend $2,000 this year on this stuff. 
We're, we're calling this the business portion of it. Okay, fine. So they take $2,000 of the grant and they say they're going to use it for these things that they've always used it for. Fine. And then the rest of the money they're paying themselves. Well, you know what? That really is the same consequence of using it all to pay themselves. Because they're, yeah, they can deduct it with the grant money, but they could have deducted it anyway. So they really had an extra 2000 to do something different with because they've already covered, they were already spending that money anyway. I don't know if that helps. I don't know if that confuses people further. All right. Uh, if I understand correctly, if they use all the money for business, then they're not taxed. Yes. Yes. But again, with the caveat, don't go out and spend money on the business just to avoid the taxes. That's like, um, let's make it simpler. A provider gets, uh, a parent pays an extra $100. They just give them an extra $100. Oh, I got an extra $100 of income, but I'm worried about paying taxes on it. So I'm gonna go out and buy something for my business. And I'm gonna deduct 100% of that. So I'm deducting 100% of the $100. Are my taxes gonna go down by $100? No, they're only gonna go down by 30 or $40. So you spent $100 in order to reduce your taxes by $30 or $40. That's not a good deal. No. If you give me $100 and I give you back $30 in tax savings, are you better off? No. You are better off holding on to the $100. So, yeah, they can spend it all on stuff for their business unless they absolutely positively needed it. And I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of providers that can say, I desperately need the 18,000 or the 38,000 or whatever it is. I definitely, absolutely need this for something they used 100% for my business. Maybe there's a rare case that that would be true, but I doubt it for most providers. So we don't want people to focus on the fact that they would, wouldn't owe taxes in that situation. Because somebody else who just kept it, kept all the money and paid themselves has a whole lot of cash on hand that they can use for their retirement or their emergency fund. All right. Uh, okay. They can also use some of the funds to help the parents struggling to pay to their tuition. Yes. Now, that's clearly in the federal regs. You know, I, I might have missed it in the New York uh, explanation. But that's true. But, but let's think about that for a minute. Let's say a provider wants to help out a struggling family. And let's say they want to forgive $1,000 of what the parent would normally pay between now and the end of the year. Let's just say, okay? So that's a generous thing to do for the parent. The parent has now saved $1,000. And if the parent is hurting financially, we're helping out that family, that's a good thing. What's the tax implication of that? Well, the provider is earning $1,000 less. And her taxes are going to be three to $400 less. But she's still, so far, hurting. She not, she's not able to turn that $1,000 discount into a thousand dollar tax savings. So how does that, how does it get reported? She's showing a thousand dollars less income of parent income. Let's say she got 15,000 from the grant. Let's say she used a thousand dollars, you know, I'm offsetting the thousand dollars, but all that means is she's keeping the thousand for herself. She's not actually giving the parent a thousand dollars. So we're back to all the money is hers. She's still paying taxes on all the money she got and she has $1,000 less. So she just needs to think about it as well. Okay, the, the 15,000 helps offset that loss of 1,000, but the taxes are the same for the grant money 
and she's a thousand dollars poorer of income. Okay. All right. Uh, questions. So in essence, if you are self-employed and have no additional employees, and what are you saying is that a provider then qualifies as a sole employee in their business? Yes. Yes. They're not really. Yes. As a, as a practical matter, a self-employed provider. I didn't say anything about corporations. So I should have said something about this. Some providers could be a corporation, S corporation, C corporation, LLC corporation, a limited liability company in which they are treated as an employee and the corporation is paying them a salary and the corporation is paying payroll taxes, all right? That's an employee, not just I'm paying you cash and, and you're not doing all these employee requirements, workers' compensation, all that stuff. We got an official employee and the provider is an employee of the corporation. In that case, corporation gets the money, they can use the grant money to pay the provider's salary, wages, social security taxes, and so on. That's a, an acceptable use of the grant money. Once a person is self-employed or a sole proprietor, for purposes of this grant, they are considered an employee. But I, I, I hesitate to use that language because then people think, well, I'm really not an employee. I don't pay myself, therefore I'm not an employee. So um, the provider gets the same ability to use the money to pay herself as if she paid somebody else as a true employee. Does that help? I hope that helps. All right. Okay, we're gonna another pay themselves question. Some providers rarely pay themselves and put most of the revenue back into their program, yes. Or make up the difference when parents don't pay them or don't give them notice, yes. So does it make sense for them just to pay themselves and keep that documentation and pay the taxes and come out ahead? Yes. Hopefully they will actually pay themselves, put some money in retirement savings. Yes. Yes to everything. So when I'm doing live training, and it's been a while, and we're, we're talking about this uh, uh, in a contracts uh, connection, I'll say, how many people have ever had parents leave owing them money? And everybody's going to raise their hand. Um, and so this is another way of saying, well, this is a way to kind of reimburse yourself for all those times that that's happened. I mean, back to January 2020, at least. If that's another way to justify it, if that makes sense to people. Uh, you, you didn't get the money that was owed you under the contract. You haven't raised your rates in two years. Uh, you know, you're, you're hurting financially. You haven't given yourself a vacation in two years. You haven't, you know, whatever. You haven't charged that registration fee. Haven't charged that late pickup fee. And so this is, this is the opportunity to say, okay, uh, uh, now I'm gonna catch up. Now I'm gonna reward myself for all that lost income uh, that I've had in the past two years. Uh, and if that makes sense to a provider, if that helps them uh, feel more comfortable in paying themselves, then good. And then say to people, yes, now this is an opportunity. You've been trying to fund your retirement account, your emergency fund, this is it. This is the time to do it, folks, rather than going out and looking for something to buy. Yes. All right, what else we got here? It's confusing because they put that statement about tuition into the attestations, but not into the allowable expenses. Yeah, it is confusing. It is confusing. Man, oh man, when I saw these federal regulations about this stuff, I was just, you know, beating my head against the wall because look, you guys, family child care is not like a child care center. And why don't you use family child care language and talk and explain to people how this works? in a setting where people are self-employed. Yeah, it is confusing. Uh, question, if a provider wants to contribute to a 401k plan, how does this impact their tax liability? How should they do this to get the most benefit? Okay, so um, let's use the example of a provider takes $10,000 to pay themselves, all right? Now, as I've said, they can use it for whatever they want. And now let's say they want to put it into retirement. Okay, 
they can put it into a traditional IRA, also called a regular IRA, a simple IRA, or a Roth IRA. Now for the regular IRA and the Roth IRA, the limit is $6,000 per year per person. So if they're married and two people working, that's $12,000. And if they're age 50 or older, it's an extra $1,000. So now we're at $7,000. For the single person, $7,000 a year. So they could put aside 7,000 in 2021 taxes and seven and uh, seven thousand dollars in their 2022 IRA, regular IRA or Roth IRA. So there's not a 401k plan. It's it's the same effect. It's the same I. It's an IRA. Um, the simple they can put aside up to thirteen thousand five hundred dollars, or if they're single, uh, or if they're over age age 50 or older, an extra three thousand. Now. If they put it into a simple IRA, a traditional IRA, uh, they will then can reduce their federal and state income tax, not their social security tax, but their federal and state income tax. So in this case, they're turning their personal, paying themselves, that they've turned into personal money that I said, oh, now you gotta pay taxes on it. Well, well, if they got 15,000 and 2,000, 21, now they can reduce that federal and state income tax by $7,000. So this is a big tax savings. This is great. Most people aren't saving enough for retirement. This is a strongly urge people to do that. If they put their money into a Roth IRA, they don't reduce their taxable income for this year or next year when they make the contribution. But the difference is, that when people take the money out of their IRA in retirement, if it's in a regular IRA or simple IRA, they're gonna to have to pay tax on the amount they put in and the interest that it earned. Where if they put it into a Roth IRA, they will not have to pay tax on what they put in and they will not have to pay tax on the interest. So I like the Roth IRA better they're giving up a tax benefit today to get a bigger tax benefit when they retire. So it is a good use of this money to put it into an IRA because either now or later, it's gonna be tax deductible for federal and state income tax purposes. All right. Uh, all right, so now, if people want to talk rather than write questions, they can unmute themselves and just speak to me or continue to post questions. Lots of good questions, but people are shy about talking. Hard to believe. Well, one thing I've always heard you say, Tom, and you've said it two or three times already, but I'll reiterate it, is uh, about not just going and buying things just to get a tax deduction. Um, you know, if you need it for the, for the daycare, fine, but don't do that. that I, I've heard providers talk about that. Oh, I went and bought this and that and the other thing so I could get a deduction. That's, that's really not not a prudent thing to do. Right. And this is going to be a great temptation now. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to get a big color TV, 95 inch color TV. It's like, eh, no. What else? Everybody's excited. <laughs> Another thing is people are thinking about things that, um, Tom, I love that you reiterated. I've told the group numerous times, um, it's the whole paying yourself and freeing up the money to spend on the questionable thing. I like, because, I like, I like the expression freeing up the money. Great. I like that. Yeah. It's, it's those things. I think I, I, I had a question come to me the other day, um, about a removing a fireplace 
And that, that was a major minor thing that I'm like, yeah. And I like what you said. It's like, well, if you just take the money for your own salary, then you can do that. You can do that project in your house that we're not quite sure. It's a real gray area. It's, you know, things like that. I don't think people should hesitate to say what you said. In other words, I think it's a gray area. I'm not sure. I, that's okay. That's an appropriate answer because I don't think we want to take wild guesses because imagine that whatever you say is going to get repeated by other people. Mm -hmm. So just say, you know what? I think it's a gray area. And therefore, A, you can take a chance and go ahead and do it. Your chances of being audited are very remote. Or B, just avoid the problem, pay yourself, and then go ahead and use the money for that. And to document paying yourself, you truly just need to put a note in your file saying I paid myself X number of dollars? What else could people, yes. I, I can't think of what else people can do. Uh, transferring the money, writing a check, or writing a note. I mean, wh what else is there? Uh, I can't think of anything else. And I've talked to other people around the country who, who've been involved with this and nobody can come up with anything other than that, those three options. Well, something else you always refer to in your trainings is the fact that a lot of providers don't take all the uh, deductions they're entitled to. Um, I don't know. I've read your book. I don't remember how many deductions are in there, but it, a thousand, a thousand. That's right. Okay. Now, so, uh, okay. That, that makes me think when people look at this list of things that they can use the grant money for, it might cause them to think, oh, I haven't been deducting some of these things. And so that may come up and you wanna say, well, yeah, yeah, you can deduct the utilities, yes. Gas, oil, uh, garbage, water, sewer, cable TV, solar panels, yes, that's utilities. Or, you know, here's another thing that I wish the state and the feds had clarified. They say mortgage payment. Mortgage payment. Well, wait a minute. If somebody had a monthly mortgage payment of $1,000, let's just say, all right? Well, and I've said, I, I think it's reasonable to say you can only use the business portion of these things. Well, can you use the business portion of the $1,000? It sounds like it for the grant purpose, but you can't for tax purposes because you can only deduct the time space percentage of the mortgage interest and the other part of that thousand which represents principal you can't deduct that business portion of that monthly principal because you get that deduction when you're depreciating your home which is a different calculation so when we careful you know when i read the language mortgage payment yeah i guess you could use 30 percent of a thousand dollars but you can't deduct that and see like wow man how about a clarification on this point no clarification. How do we avoid this? Just pay yourself and forget about the mortgage payment because you're always entitled to deduct that piece anyway under the tax rules. Tom, one of the things that we're hearing from more than one provider is that they're, they're concerned that if they take it as salary, that they get tax on the 30,000 that the grant gives them and then they get taxed an additional 30,000 because it's now sell. They, uh, they, and, and that I think tonight really needs to be clarified because we're, I'm hearing it and, and yeah. they think it's 60,000 instead of 30,000, just to give it an example. Can yeah. you repeat that concern? Yeah, let me, let me try to say that. Yes, that's a good point. And I briefly mentioned it, but since you brought it up, it's like, okay, I need to emphasize this more. A provider gets 30,000 from the stabilization grant and they use the 30,000 to pay themselves. And I've said, okay, you're gonna pay tax on the 30,000. But the concern is that once they pay themselves, kind of like paying an employee, now they're an employee receiving 30,000. Now they have to pay the tax on the receiving of the 30,000. So they're paying tax twice, 30,000 once, 30,000 again. 
and say, so, whoa, now the taxes are way, way up there. No, no, no. When they get the money to pay themselves, they're paying tax on the 30. They're not paying it again. They don't treat themselves as paying themselves as, a, as, as income again. It's income once. Good point. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Oh, yeah. I think it did, but it also brought up another question then. So if the provider received 30000 and paid themselves, would the program take that $30,000 in income or should the individual receiving the $30,000 pay that as income? Like so, where would you want to see the tax? So are we talking about a self-employed person? Okay. The 30000 is coming to them as an individual. And they pay themselves, they're still the individual. So the individual, when they file their individual Schedule C tax return, they're showing 30,000 in the same way as if they got 30,000 from parents. Does that help? If they're a corporation, the answer is, is different. The 30,000 comes to the corporation. That's corporation income. When the corporation hires the provider as an employee, they're paying the employee wages. And they could use the 30,000 as, uh, this is a good question. They could use the 30,000 as wages for their employee provider. So the corporation is showing 30,000 of income and now 30,000 as an expense by paying the salary. And now the individual provider who got the salary reports the 30,000 of income. It's not taxed twice. That's a good one. Question, I heard a rumor that you're retiring. Will your website stay up when you do retire? Uh, I, when people ask me that question now, I'm answering it. Yes, I'm retiring early next year. I'm planning on keeping my website up. And what I'm doing now is spending a lot of time going through each of the 1600 articles on there and updating them you know, taking out old dates, uh, cleaning it up. And then what I plan to do is uh, compile a, for lack of a better word, the best of Tom uh, for all these different categories, the best, uh, the best 20 articles on contracts, the best 20 articles on retirement, whatever. Okay. So it'll end up being several hundred probably. And then putting them in a format in like a PDF kind of format so that organizations and individuals, okay, I'll, I'll send out the word. Here are all these links to these groups of articles that any organization is free to then post on their website, to share, to pass out whoever they want. And anybody who comes to my website will see that now as a way of, of, uh, of getting access, better access to the best of the articles in there because there's stuff I wrote in 2011 <clears throat> that's good, but nobody's reading it anymore because nobody's going back to 2011. So uh, that's what I'm up to. All right, other questions? Any other questions? I wanna make sure I'm hearing something right. Go ahead. So I know um, providers are hesitant about paying themselves. So instead, for example, they get a $10,000 grant and their yearly budget for all of their allowable expenses is $10,000. So they take that $10,000 grant, put it into their budget and the money that would have paid the budget, they can spend on the roof, the pool, the Hawaii cruise, the whatever. Right? Right. Okay. That's right. So I, I'm glad you used that term, the budget. So, so a provider, it, let's just look ahead to 2022. So a provider's budgeting 50, I don't know what, $50,000 of income and $20,000 of expenses. So that's in their budget and they're planning to cover those expenses with their 50,000. Great. So now they get 20,000 of a grant. So they can look at it as, I'm still, I still budgeted for the 20,000 out of that 50,000 of income. So now I have this 
free extra 20,000 I can do whatever I want with. You could look at it that way, or you could look at it to say, I'm gonna use the grant money to pay for these uh, $20,000 of expenses. And now I have another, this 20,000 that I was gonna spend on I, out of the 50, I now I have again to do whatever I want with. So yes, I don't know if one way is better of saying it than the other way, but uh, yes, they're, they've already budgeted for these expenses. They got them covered with their other income. This is just extra income on the top that they didn't need it. It's not in their budget. They don't weren't planning on spending it. They don't need to spend it. So now we got 20,000. Go to Hawaii and take my wife and me with you. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, okay, we've got another question. A lot of providers were upset that the payments are using their social security number rather than their EIN. Ah, is that much of a difference considering they're a sole proprietor? No, it doesn't. Boy, I don't know why they're not accepting the EIN, but okay, uh, we always recommend providers get an EIN so that uh, for identity theft purposes and never give out their social security number to parents. But okay, now we got this government agency saying we need your social security number does that have any impact? No, it has no impact whatsoever because the IRS has a provider social security number and they know that the provider has an EIN. So whether the money gets reported to the IRS as on the 1099 using a social security number or using an EIN number makes no difference at all because the IRS knows who that person is. Last questions. Remember, you have questions after today, give me a call. I'm gonna soon be deleting my phone number from everything. Send me an email, uh, look at my website for other stuff. Refer, feel free to pass out this contact information to providers. So if you're nervous about something, say, well, call Tom, ask Tom. Uh, I'm not sure. That's okay. Uh, we want to try to help providers uh, wherever we can. Question, does that only apply to sole proprietors? Sole proprietors are the same as self-employed. Uh, if it's a corporation um, uh, and the corporation is going to have an EIN and yeah, Social Security, it's not gonna make any difference. It's not going it's really not gonna make any difference. Just as long as people are reporting their income, that's what's important. All right, how do we get the slides for this? How do we get the slides for this webinar? Uh, Ed, can you answer that question? I can't, but Jessica. We will send them out, Ed. On to um, everyone that or Meredith, yes. This is Meredith. I will send them out to everyone that registered. Not a problem at all. I was going to ask a question, Tom. Um, is this pretty much the same exact content that you will go over tonight with the 1,000 child care providers that are registered? And then I'm doing a plug to the thousand child care providers that are um, registered for Saturday. Yes, I, the, the language. I'm I'm changing a little bit the language. Uh, you know, sorts the language a little more direct to providers, but 99.9% .9 of the words are the same. It was excellent. And just so everyone knows as well, if your child care providers aren't able to attend either tonight's session or Saturday's session, it's recorded and we will get the slides out to anyone that, uh, you know, to all of you from tonight's session, plus the recording so that you can share that with everyone. And there will be Spanish language interpretation available tonight. Oh. Uh, and yeah. then when when we get the uh, material from from Meredith, we'll we'll post them on our website too. Great. All right, all right. It's better to end early than to go late. <laughs> so last call for any questions, either. Last call for alcohol. <laughs> 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 this is recorded, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, that's it from me.
Thanks everybody for the work you're doing. I know I've been traveling around New York in years past many times. So I assume I've seen some of you guys in person uh, and thanks for all the work you do. Good night, everybody. Good night. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.